start to look at understanding different areas of policy design, building awareness, understandings of best practice and looking at new developments within policy design. And we're working alongside the LPSN to put together these events over the next few months. So thanks everyone for coming along. Um, I'll hand you back to Katrina just for a few, any extra house rules and then over to Paul. Yeah, so generally uh, there will be a post presentation uh, after that, a bit of a Q&A for all of your questions. Uh, there's also obviously the opportunity to ask questions in the chat. Um, and with that said, I'm handing over to Paul. OK, thank you. Uh, so I, right. Uh, so I, I can see the chat. If I, I, there's a couple of ways we can do this. One is for me to go through the whole presentation and then talk at the end. But I think I think if I can cope with the chat, uh, or especially if you put it in all caps, I can answer your questions as you go along. Because this is, it, it should be a, a f fairly simple to be interactive here. In uh, I'm really just going to show you a bunch of images and see what you think. Uh, and I like the idea. I think there's a some, sometimes at a lunchtime uh, workshop, I try and multitask. You know, I'll do some uh, walk on a treadmill or something with a camera off. So if you're doing that, that's fine too, because I think all the images are just there. I'm not going to give you any small text that you have to pay attention to. So dealer's choice. So I, I think this is an interesting question. I think for a lot of people in policy making and policy design, you know, if you if you are asked what does policy making look like. Uh, and you're asked to visualise it. It's not straightforward in terms of what you would come up with, or I think the point is people would come up with different images for different purposes. You know, it's very hard to think of a, a universal image that everyone could point to. Instead, people are seeing the policy making through particular perspectives and their, their images reflect that. So I'm just going to go through a bunch of them. Hopefully, um, I don't know what you can see on the screen. Hopefully you can only see one of the screens. I can see them all, but I don't know if you can. you. Can you see all of them or um or we can currently one? see the first one uh, we are able to kind of navi navigate but we still yeah. kind of see the, ah. the big what does policy making look like okay so let's just just make a commitment not to look at the other ones below there just look at the top one uh, otherwise it's a bit spoiled okay so here's a question i think in terms of why would we do it uh, so there are three or four reasons. So one, I think if you do policy studies like me, it's to describe what policymakers do or how policy systems work, you know, something like that. For a lot of people in practice, they might visualise what policymakers need to do. So that's more like a list of tasks that they have to complete to, to, to produce a particular outcome. Then I think a lot of uh, images are quite aspirational. They describe what policymakers would like to do. OK, so uh, without necessarily achieving that goal. And then fourth, uh, there is what policymakers or governments would like you to think that they do. So they project an image of something. And usually in a sort of uh, UK or Westminster context, they project order out of chaos or something like that. You know, essentially they say, OK, the world might be complex, but look, we know exactly what we're doing. It tends to be linear, very simple. OK. So the first question then would be, is there an image that can sum up all of these things? And this is not entirely facetious, but uh, hopefully a lot of, a lot of these uh, uh, images are very kind of UK centric. OK, so the first one, let's see what you think. If this sums up all of these tasks. Uh, hopefully that is familiar to lots of people. So yeah, I guess if you work in the UK government, I don't think you could avoid this one. Yeah, because it's in the it's in the green book. And this is essentially a, a cycle of tasks uh, produced by the Treasury uh, that, that, that describes what, for, uh, now take your pick, what governments do or would like to do or what you or would like to be able to think that they do. So that's usually a, an interesting starting point. I should say I use this image because I haven't met anyone in government Oh, no, it's just terrible grammar. I haven't met anyone in government who hasn't said something along the lines of, uh, you know, th this cycle does not sum up what we do. You know, it sums up what we present. You know, essentially, I think civil servants are sometimes like academics. They put up an image largely to say what doesn't happen so they can then compare it with, a, you know, a messy reality or something like that. And for me, the interesting thing is if that's what the image is for, to project, what we do without necessarily doing it. You know, some 
government departments can have some fun with how, you know, what the kinds of things that they would like to project they do. So here's an example. I didn't put on who the departments are just to give you a sense. If you want to treat it like a quiz. Here's a here's an old one. Here's an old image of what a. A government would said would say it would do, and I think you know the whole point of this image. You know, it's a cycle image again, but it's essentially to say, look at how often we uh, engage with people. You know, because it is a cycle in a sense, but also they engage with uh, stakeholders at every sense. I don't know if anyone would would know that one. I would want to guess which government's cycle that was. I guess you could stick in the chat if you wanna if you wanna guess. Ah, no one's willing. OK, so that, that used to be that that was like an old Scottish government one or Scottish executive one. And that's the image they were going for. Look at how consultative we are. Much more consultative than the UK government. Uh, that tended to be the, the subtext. OK, uh, here's another example. Which I think projects something else. It's very much a cycle again, but it's essentially saying, look at all the uh, our attention to detail here. I think it's going to be very hard for you to read the text, but I think it's just the image there. The projection is, uh, you know, we've really thought about how we're doing all this stuff. You know, look at our checklist, it's massive. So I don't know if, ah, so I don't know if the guesses, I don't know if the DHS has guesses for this one or the last one. Uh, but this one uh, is the home office, or it was the home office. Okay, and there are lots of different examples of that. It used to be, if you remember, the National School of Government had a compass type image as well. I think they're all given this sense of, uh, you know, we have to turn complex reality into a series of steps or questions that we can use to to do things. OK, so those are examples from government. Now I'd like to move into examples from. From policy studies. Uh, OK, with a different aim, you know, with with policy studies, with people like me, we're not really trying to say what, what governments should do uh, or design a uh, process. We're really just trying to describe what happens. OK, so you would normally, I think, in policy studies, start with images like this. On the, on the left hand side, you have a kind of classic, simple policy cycle that's broken down into a series of, of well, whatever. Now, it's, it's interesting what you would call them. You could call them stages or you could call them tasks or functions. I think these images are OK if you just call them functions or functional requirements and you take away the arrows. You know, it's just a list of things that governments have to do. You know, they have to define problems. They have to come up with a range of possible solutions. They have to select one. They have to legitimize their choices. You know, they have to implement and they have to, you know, evaluate what they've done. That, that side of it's fine. I think the problem is when, when you know, people try and put it into a cycle that makes it look like it's an orderly process where the initiation of one step makes the rest of it inevitable. And I think it has led to, so there's a, a kind of, I would compare that with the metaphor in the top right, which is just an image of, a, I think it's an electricity system in Thailand or something like that. You know, it does work, you know, it, it's complex, but it works. But the, the one the one that's more interesting to me is on the bottom right there. You can just about see it. And one part of the European Commission used to put this image up in its um, presentations on evidence informed policy and that sort of thing. And essentially, I think what it says is, you know, look at our policy process. Uh, it's very messy and who knows what happens? You know, the, the arrows don't go anywhere uh, or, or they go in particular squiggles. And there's a cycle under there, but I think the, the point that they're trying to project is there's a contrast between the cycle that the Commission presents and you know what actually their process is in practice. And in that context, the point was it's very difficult to know how to inform policy with evidence if you don't know what the policy process is. Okay, which is which I thought was quite um bold for a part of a commission that would normally present itself as you know orderly and that would try to legitimize its activities with an appeal to order okay so imagine the uk government imagine a uk government department or minister put this on a powerpoint and said you know look at our process who knows who knows what's going on here it would be quite a bold move i think it might be it would be quite honest but also uh, quite bold okay so uh the, i suppose the problem with 
images like the one on the top right is that all they really visualize is complexity. They, they don't really say what's happening. They, they, don't, they don't guide you. You know, they, they just give you a sense of this is complicated. So uh, I think in policy studies, you can find more of a range of images that can be more useful uh, in different contexts. OK, could they help, they help you to explain particular things? OK. OK, not user friendly. So the, the complexity one is not user friendly. OK, so that's fair enough. I mean, it, it does the job, I think. It just says, oh, look at the mess. You know, not so simple. OK, so let's let's look at some more useful ones. Uh, I've tried to categorize these one for each category. So. First one is we'll stick to metaphor. And just just ignore for now. The fact that. Um, you know, academics like to debate the smallest of things, and I, and I think I'm the only one who likes this metaphor for this theory. OK, so but yeah, I'm in charge today, so it doesn't really matter. So this metaphor is I've taken this from NASA, you know, a NASA space flight. And I think the point of the metaphor is that if you describe, not that I can really describe space flights or anything, uh, but the um, the idea of a space flight is a, a number of conditions have to be met before this flight happens. And it's, you know, like they have to have fuel, the, all the, I don't, I don't know, all the lights have to be green instead of red, and the weather has to be correct. You know, so some of it is in their control, some of it is out of their control, but it all has to happen at the same time before something takes off. And I think that's the metaphor for uh, you know, a multiple streams type explanation of major policy change. It essentially says policy change will not change in a major way unless certain things come together at the same time. You know, so that's what the metaphor is. In that case, the things that have to come together, uh, you, know, you can produce a little narrative like um, there has to be uh, enough targeted uh, policymaker attention to a particular way of seeing a policy problem. A solution has to exist to deal with that problem, and policymakers have to have the motive and opportunity to deal with it during a limited window of opportunity. And I think essentially that describes nonlinearity because in that case, uh, this so this is Kingdon, and he suggests essentially a solution to a problem has to exist before policymakers pay attention to it. Because once they pay attention to it, their, their attention is fleeting and people could, will not be able to come up with feasible solutions in that amount of time. You know, so OK, so the metaphor describes nonlinearity. I think actually before that, people used this garbage can metaphor. So I could have put up an image of a you know, wheelie bin with a load of stuff in it. But again, I think I think this is more the metaphor that I would go for. It's it's not just a mess. It is. The requirement of a certain number of conditions to, to uh, happen at the same time before something takes off. OK, so. OK, so. Uh, next image. This one is about visualizing data, so this is not metaphorical at all. This is a measure of something in this case. It's a, a measure of, so this is punctuated equilibrium theory, and they essentially measure uh, two different things here. Uh, I don't know if you, how, you, how, how um, when the last time you did a sort of stats module or something like that, but essentially they, they identify a huge number of small policy changes and a small number of huge policy changes. That is how you know, people in this project, when they measure policy change, in this case in budgets, what they measure is, uh, uh, if you, you can see in the middle, this this huge uh, gathering of, of of changes around the zero, you know, plus or minus, a very small amount. But on the, particularly on the right hand side, you can see a small number of profound changes to policy. So in this case, is in this case that is what they're trying to measure and visualize that this that policy making is not simply incremental. It, it's you know not everything changes by uh, you know a series of steps or small steps. Sometimes you have almost no change, you know hyper incremental change. Uh, no, sorry, most of the time you have hyper incremental change, and in a small number of cases you have these profound changes. 
And I think the point here with, with how they visualise things is that they are not predicting which times will change. They are simply measuring the fact that some of them do. OK, and uh, I think increasingly their comparison is with the measurement of earthquakes. You know, the vast majority are really low uh, uh, impact earthquakes, but then there's a small number with a profound impact. And, you know, it, it, they're not they're, they're measuring them. They're, they're showing the distribution. They're not trying to predict them. OK, so I think that's useful in a sense that it visualizes what's happened, but I guess not too useful if you want to predict what happens. OK, next image is. Visualizing processes in this case. The point is to essentially uh, turn our you know, complex policymaking system into a series of factors that would influence what happens. Uh, now, actually, to be honest, this one takes a bit of time that I don't like this one because because I, I reckon if you can read the text, you're now reading the text instead of listening to my explanation of it. But um, so so it doesn't work as an image. It works in a book. It doesn't work in a presentation. But I think uh, if, if I would, what I would guide you to is the biggest box on the right hand side there, uh, the headache policy subsystem. And essentially what the advocacy coalition framework is trying to sum up is this idea that people go into politics to turn their beliefs into policy. They form coalitions with people who share their beliefs and they compete with coalitions of people who have different beliefs. That competition takes place within a subsystem, which is a bit like I, I don't know what you would call a policy subsystem. It could be a policy community or a policy niche or a, one part of a network, something like that. It's a specialist part of uh, you know, policy making processes where people are dealing with one issue. So so the sort of things we would study are you know, things like fracking policy or uh, you know, particular aspects of environmental policy, something like that. It, they, they take place not not across a whole political system, but in a subsystem. And um, uh, you know, one coalition tends to dominate for long periods, or they negotiate an outcome that that tends to endure. So that's why you have the main box there, and it's surrounded by these processes that have a key influence on how those subsystems operate. So, you know, on the left hand side, you talk about things that are stable. On the bottom, things that might uh, have a profound impact on those subsystems. And as the top middle box is really a, to describe how those processes would, would be different in different political systems. So that one takes a bit more time to, to work out, but that's essentially trying to sum up a whole, a whole process. OK, so let's compare that with with my effort. So before I show you for a while, I was doing I was doing all these talks and I was putting up the policy cycle and saying how inaccurate it was and that sort of thing. But it, but the problem with competing images is that the, particularly this one is that they're too complicated to compete with the cycle's value as an image of something that you can pick up and use straight away. Okay, you you it it doesn't this I reckon this one's very off-putting. To me, I kind of grow and I think, or oh, I'm trying to imagine the amount of work it would take to fully understand what was going on within it. Uh, whereas the one I would come up with gives you the, the opposite impression. Hopefully, I've gone for blue because I think that's the the most pleasing colour, isn't it? You want to avoid. I think if you're trying to dissuade people from smoking, you go for it's a sort of vomit green, isn't it, on the packaging? So I think blue is the pleasing, the pleasing colour. And here I'm trying to turn the same complex policy process into something that's that is projected as simple. And essentially you can tell a simple story about policy making that, that, that takes insights from lots of these images. So essentially it talks about. Um, well, the psychology of choice is this idea. So a key phrase in policy studies is bounded rationality. You know, uh, policymakers can only pay attention to a tiny proportion of their responsibilities. And so they pay attention to some and they ignore the rest. Or they can only uh, pay attention to a very small proportion of the information available, so they ignore most of it. That sort of thing. And they're surrounded by a policymaking environment in which there are multiple actors or you know influencers and policymakers spread across different uh, levels or types of government each of those levels of types of government has its own rules and you know informal rules and 
uh, ways of thinking. Each uh, venue has its own relationships between policymakers and influencers, and each venue has its own ways of working and thinking, and so on and so on. Okay, so that's what this image is really there to sum up. In the same sense that policy making does not simply take place in one centre of government, it takes place across multiple centres, each with their own ways of working. Okay. So, those are the ways in which you would visualise policy making as a, you know, a sort of policy political scientist, a policy scientist, and really just trying to understand what's going on. I think then you have a different need for images if you're actually engaged in policy making and you need to do things. So that's that's what we focus on next. To be honest, I'm hoping that you will tell me about images associated with that. I, I did get some a couple of ideas based on the the post I put up originally. Uh, but these are ones that I've just picked up from hearing people talk about the things that they uh, pay attention to over the years. Uh, so this is about how can we sum up what we need to do or we would like to do in a, in a simple way. So again, the next one's a quiz just to see if it's still as um, important as it used to be. Here's one simple way of visualising uh, your key approach to policy making. I'd be interested if you can tell me uh, what it is. There's no prizes for the quiz, but I'd be interested if if, if you would know or, uh, what this visualization is. No, I'm getting no takers, no takers in the chat. Yeah, it's, it is decision making. It is so, but it's um. Uh, so, I mean, I think the problem is it doesn't quite look like a triangle, does it? It really should look like a triangle, but it doesn't. Uh, but it doesn't. Ah, yes, yeah. It's the more. Yeah, it is the more. It's the um. It's the strategic triangle. I, I'm, I'll bet you there's different images of the where it's actually a triangle, but it's supposed to talk about. Uh, public value approaches to policy making, which were which were which were important from the 90s onwards, uh, in which you know uh, policymakers were um, encouraged to be more entrepreneurial and to think about three basic tasks that are three basic requirements of their work. Uh, you know, so one is that it produced public value, which is you know more than uh, value to individual consumers. Uh, the other, you could generate legitimacy for the, the task, and the other is that it was technically feasible. So yeah, so technically feasible, politically feasible, and deliver public value, something like that. So, okay, so I wonder if I've picked, a, if you've got different images of the strategic triangle, I'd be interested. But I think that's that's one that, that, that certainly uh, was very um, popular from the 90s, maybe 2000s and on, onwards. Okay, the next one, which is interesting to me, uh, which I didn't know until recently. So I just I just picked this up largely from eavesdropping. When we talked about it before this event. Next one uh, is you can you visualize agile? So okay, so I don't know. You can give me a sense if this is more well known or the the idea of agile is more well known. I actually had a look for how people try to visualize Agile this morning. And I could only come up with this one, which is more about its origins in software development. But I like this one because it's taken us right back to the idea of uh, trying to visualize a series of functions. OK, and I think you can do that in lots of different ways. And again, I think this gives a sense that there's a kind of linear process. Uh, but I've seen, actually, I've looked on the UK government website. It actually describes Agile more as a mindset than a set of key tasks. And I've no idea how you visualize a mindset unless really this is about using lots of post-it notes on a, on a board at meetings. Okay. Okay, so yes, uh, Kate, agile policy making is quite a discussion and that's what I'm hoping for. Uh, so that that is, um, that is, those are all of my images for today. I would be interested to, in, in knowing what sort of images that you use or 
you know, open to questions on the presentation itself. So, thank you. So on my screen, Katharina is just frozen. I don't know if. Um... Yeah, she's, I think she's frozen for me as well. Uh, OK. <laughs> just exact, exactly the wrong time. Then. Sorry, did you? Yeah, that, that's that's me done. <laughs> OK, um, that's great. Um, should we kind of hand it over to the floor with anyone kind of having any questions or um yeah just shoot and get the conversation started i i was kind of myself thinking about uh, you know how much of this is what it actually looks like and how much of this perhaps not the necessarily the messy ones but the metaphors and the um the very kind of straightforward ones how much is what is desirable and how you want it to be like and to to be able to so I'm currently developing a, a service offer for Matt for my my policy service basically within the organization and it's very much like why do we matter why what is it that we do and how are we relevant for the rest of the organization and how are we important and I feel like part of these cycles is also just like you said in the beginning kind of uh, yeah telling how do oh look at how much we collaborate but how much does that play in 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 when we're trying to figure out what the policy cycle actually looks like. How is it? Is it possible yeah. to get rid of that bias, basically? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I guess the, the, the image that came into my mind when you described it, you, you might, yeah, you want a, a picture of everyone holding hands or something, you know, trying to project togetherness. Uh, and yeah, so that, that could very well be one of the four functions of an image, you know, just to project something uh, to people about what you think they're collective endeavor is. Uh, so, yeah, so I suppose that's interesting to me in terms of my impression with speaking with civil servants in particular is that the images that they pay most attention to are the ones that are about key tasks involved in their job, you know, key processes. Yes, you know, so I think Agile is one of one of them, but it's any, any kind of process they use to fulfill the, the requirements of their job or something like that. Uh, and and that's so that that's probably I, I suppose you would say that's zooming in to a particular thing uh, that, that, that without necessarily zooming back out to think about how it relates to a process. So I think all the images that I presented in terms of policy processes, they're very much zooming out. You know, they're, they're trying to describe a system as a whole. You know, so I, I think there's there's a key difference there in terms of you, you zoom out to describe a system as a whole to to describe context, which is what most of my colleagues do. But you zoom in to describe particular uh, people and tasks and organizations. So I, th I think that's the trick, isn't it? I mean, I think probably the, the limitation is that we have these 2D static images when really we're trying to describe something 3D that zooms in and out. So I'm conscious there's a lot of uh, images now coming in on the chat. I don't know if anyone wants to talk to any of them in particular. Uh, I think we have some hands up as well um, in okay. the, uh, yeah, Andrew, Andrew, <laughs> Andy, um, Knight, uh, do you want to share your question? Um, can I show my picture? You know, am, I, am I allowed to share my screen so I can show my picture? Uh, yes. I can make you uh, a presenter. If Paul allows it. <laughs> oh, so can I? Do I have to unshare? Uh, no, I think if my, if no. uh, and Andy shares, then yours automatically goes away. Okay. Okay, I've got it. Uh... Can you see that? Yes. Uh, so this is what we've been talking to policymakers in government about, and uh, this is kind of this is probably 
lends itself to your kind of agile policy making because it probably it comes from that sort of tradition uh and this is how we see uh policy being made around government where you know it kind of gets designed someone has a brilliant idea that it gets sort of sent to someone to be built then they'll pilot it and then they'll write an evaluation years later um and what we're trying to you know encourage policymakers to do is to uh go to more of this kind of model where uh that this is sort of evidence-led policy making where they're thinking about research first understand the world then de your designs should respond to the world as you find it and then you'll still have assumptions so you kind of test uh prove and disprove you know your ideas and then Finally, the final thing you should do is build and you'll be building at that point where you're really confident that your ideas will have the effect that you expect them to have. And that's a great way to kind of uh, not only safeguard uh, uh, public value, but also it just makes you look great as, a, as an official because you deliver what you say. Um, and then kind of lead it, lead, you know, sort of further to that, then we talk about, you know, that research block what kind of research should you be doing and uh, we talk about the public value sweet spot lying at the centre of this Venn diagram where you have government intent what are the dials that the government wants to move change in the world the system what does the environment look like the operating environment that your uh, that your policy or service has to survive and thrive in uh, and then finally, people, what do they, what do the citizens need and what will they respond to? And if you don't kind of, you know, get a balance of those and make trade offs against those different elements, then your service is going to struggle. Um, and then we're trying, we've tried to turn this into a kind of a canvas that people can use. So the Venn diagram is on the left. Uh, but that kind of, you know, try, this tries to articulate that you have research that should uh, that should translate into sort of design responses, you know, at hardwiring outcomes in there. And, uh, and then eventually, you know, you're kind of the thing that you are actually going to build is sort of somewhere on the right hand side. Uh, but that's our kind of uh, approach at the moment. I think people have also been posting quite a lot of uh, pictures in the uh, in the chat, which <laughs> look more or less uh, straightforward. Yeah, I mean, I suppose the thing that springs to mind in, in terms of Andrew's visualization is, I, I suppose, it goes back to that uh, focus on what the image is for. So I think those images are very much for, you know, to guide people through a process, aren't they? A, way, a process and a way of thinking. And I, and I suppose, again, the, the, the images that I'm used to focusing on, they're trying to visualise a huge number of processes going on at the same time. You know, so, you know, a, a lot of the complexity type images are essentially to say, you know, 101 different organisations are doing 1,001 different things. And they're all happening at the same time, and many of them interact to produce, you know, uh, lots of different effects on policy. And you know, that I think that's useful for me and colleagues in terms of thinking, what does all this activity add up to? You know, if you measure all activity across UK government and across different levels, well, you know, what emerges from the whole thing? Whereas I think when you're in government, you you I, I, there's probably a luxury to to consider how everything fits together. Whereas you have to focus on doing things process at a time, you know, one, one thing at a time, focus the minds for a period of time to get something done. Uh, and so I think that's the difference, isn't it? It's about visualising what you, you would like to be doing or you would like to encourage people to be doing versus visualising what you think is actually happening, happening when you zoom out. Okay. I, I guess yeah. a lot of the these images are similar, aren't they? They're, they're ways to visualise how to produce something that's simple enough to be able to be practical, to help you identify key things to do, rather than to sum up, you know, what it all adds up to. Um, there's another hand up from one of the participants if they want to come off mute and ask their question. Yeah, 
Oh, you're muted. Gone on to mute. Right, I bumped it. Um, I mean, I put a couple of things in the diagram. All these iterative um, examples you use all miss one key element, which is the speed of iteration. How many corrective cycles you can do, which is in many ways a better determiner. It's less important how you execute an iterative cycle than that you do lots of them and do. I mean, you can imagine if you're driving a car, if you're only allowed to move the steering wheel four times an hour, driving would be a lot harder than if you could continuously adjust. But it's hard to get across. It seems to me, I don't really know how to get that across to people. What is that way of doing that? Yeah, that's a good point. So, so I mean, I th I think when when I start off with the idea of you know that, that, that very first picture, the policy cycle, I think that's one of the things to know. You know, it does give this impression of there's a single activity going on at the heart of government or something like that. There's there's one organisation doing one thing uh, for a particular point of time without really a, a sense of the the amount of times they go through a cycle or the um, or how long it takes. But I think the idea of you know something like Rome F or something like that is that you do it once. So I don't I don't think Rome F or or, or you like a very simple cycle is set up to give you the sense that you do it lots of times. So I do think you do you do need different images for that idea of continuously doing things. And it, I suppose it takes us on to interesting questions about uh, how a government could project what it's doing and describing it as a good thing. But also uh, trying to fit that in to what people's understanding of government is. So I think, for example, imagine you said that that um, you know your cycle, your process was part of a trial and error process. Okay, we do lots and lots of things. We learn from error. We learn from feedback, and we keep changing as a result. And I think I've brought up. You know, I think I think that's what people who study you know policy making complexity give a sense of. You know, you need to. Give up this idea of you know high central government control, delegate to lots of different people who can adapt to particular circumstances and can learn and that sort of thing. But I think the problem is that that, that kind of image of experimentation does not fit in with you know Westminster stories of of who is in charge and what they do. You know, imagine a government says essentially we're going to delegate a lot of this stuff to other people, and they're going to make lots of mistakes or lots of errors, and they're going to learn from their errors over time. That's not how it's very difficult to reconcile that kind of image of policy making with what people say they're going to do in, in elections or manifestos or something like that. But that, that's one of those tricks, tricky things. I've never been quite when I've, when I've sort of tried to well, have conversations with civil servants about making policy. You know, essentially you would, we would coalesce around some kind of idea that things are complicated and they don't fit into models or that sort of thing. But they still come back to that sense that they have to project what they do in a particular way. You know, they have to tell a story of what they do, and it has to fit in with a story of, of Westminster politics. And I think that's maybe less, slightly less true in devolved contexts, uh, but 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 not profoundly different. You know, so say in the Scottish context, I, I think the Scottish government still has to project this image of, of being in control. You know, they produce a manifesto. They're going to carry out that manifesto. If they don't manage it, they'll be held to account in the next election. They're not putting up these images of lots of different iterative processes. At least ministers aren't doing that. But isn't continuous improvement the way of telling that story of, of redefining it from error correct? Continuous improvement is error correction, right? So just by changing the language and framing. Yeah, I th yeah. So I think I, I think there's more scope for organisations to use that language. Yeah. So. Talk about you know continuous improvement in public services or something like that. Uh, yeah, and I, and I think lots of organisations have their own ways of describing that. You know, it's sort of the process, but still within that context of being asked to do particular things, and being blamed for not meeting particular targets. I mean, I think continuous improvement is like I think is one of those excellent terms for people in the field who know what the job is and how long it takes to do things. Uh, but it's it it's it's not a great term to sell to the public. About what they're involved in, you know. I get imagine a manifesto that essentially says we're just going to foster continuous improvement. I don't think it's specific enough. I don't think it's, uh, you know, it would it would fit in with the ambitions of a manifesto or something like that. So I think there's there are those. Yeah, if you're in a field in a, a routine job, 
for either a regulator or a public service organisation. That, that is that's the language, isn't it? But it's not the it's not the language of the system that overlays what they do. Yeah, it's the old campaign in poetry governing prose malarkey, though, isn't it? You'd have to have a different way. They have to be related, but they're different. Um, if there are any other questions, feel free to put your, your hands up um, or just come off mute and ask. If not, Paul, would you want me to pull a few out from the chat? Oh, yeah, please do, yeah. Uh, so you've got one in here about, but you might follow on quite nicely from that question. Can you speak on the acknowledgement or learnings possible from failure within policy making? Uh, yeah. Quite a big question, isn't it? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think again, that comes down to the context in which you would visualise these things. Uh, so, I, yeah, I, th I think in policy studies, uh, I, th I think lots of arguments are essentially that government is all about trial and error. Uh, they, they, they don't, they never have full information. They're never sure exactly what's going to happen when they make choices. And they can combine lots of different policy instruments to try and make some things happen. So they try and visualize how to learn continuously from what they do. And I think actually, uh, yeah, I could have put one up. There, are, I think there are images of things like double loop learning and triple loop learning and that sort of thing, which describes that kind of thing. Um, so I mean, I suppose on the other hand, what you know, studies of policy making suggest is that. You know, governments are not in the routine business of learning things. In fact, there's a strong incentive not to learn. Uh, so, for example, you know, uh, I think there's a if you're in research, there's a sort of notional a percentage of uh, the budget that you want to attach to evaluation of projects. And I think I think lots of researchers they'll start with twenty percent and they'll settle for ten percent or something like that, and then they'll go into government and find that it could, it's, it could be uh, it could be zero percent. Uh, or there's an incentive, I think, for a government in control to avoid high profile evaluations of what, what it does, because these are highly contested processes. You know, this is about the success or failure of a government, and that's not just something that can subject you know to scientific evaluation. So I think, yeah, you can you can visualize key processes of learning and 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 they're quite you know aspirational and and they make sense uh but again it, it's very difficult to know how pervasive those processes are within government i mean i don't know if the you know people in the, the chat are, are, are if that's what describe and you know this is a, an aspirational process or or something that happens routinely Uh, there's a slightly different question in the chat looking at, is there any reason behind um, technical limitations why policy visualisation remains static 2D images? Um, surely any conversation around process and iteration involves 3D or 4D to help um, stakeholders and the public understand processes as, as they progress, rotate and change. Yeah, yeah, I think that, yeah, there are limitations, aren't there, in terms of what you're trying to, I mean, a lot of this presentation goes through is, is PowerPoint, isn't it? So the limitations to PowerPoint, uh, I guess there are a lot of the ways that governments communicate are through documents or static websites or something. So, so you would accept that you would expect a, a static process. Uh, but I suppose, um, on the other hand, I think a lot of these images are there to project simplicity. You know, that's part of their job. Is to, is to say, look at the, you know, we're going to boil this process down into a small number of dynamics or a small number of uh, tasks or stages or something like that. So, so it makes sense in terms of it's, uh, you know, pleasing to the mind when you're trying to process information. I think the issue with, a, you know, a 3D image or video or something like that is that um, it, the more you get into how complicated and dynamic a process is, the more accurate you become. But also, the less easy it is for someone new to the process to understand it and to engage with it, you know. So, I mean, I suppose I suppose I suppose I get this with students for the first time, you know, from trying to sum up 
uh, complexity and how we describe it. it. You know, it can take a year. It can take a year of study in a master's program to become comfortable with all the ways of visualizing this process. And I think it's different if you're then trying to project something to people who will only engage once or, you know, you're going to give them a sense of what you're doing and they have to pick it up straight away. Uh, and, I th and I think maybe, you know, so a, a, you know, kind of complicated image is not your friend during that process. So I, I guess, yeah, it comes down to how much time you have with people to explain things, and how much uh, willingness they have to engage before they before they would switch off. There's another question in the chat that follows on quite well from that, looking at who were your audience for your visualizations and does this have an impact on your design and your wording? And I think we just had a hand up in the chat if they want to come off mute next after this question. Yeah, so that's an interesting question. So I've done this kind of presentation once or twice and and then my audience, I think, are, you know, largely uh, policy designers, you know, who have the time and space to reflect on what they do. Uh, and, uh, you know, think, often think visually and so are interested in different ways, you know, as a sort of um, an intellectual puzzle, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, the, this, the, the images that I put up that are policy studies, I think uh, by and large, we represent our own audience. You know, so I think part, most of my colleagues don't really worry about how their images look to a wider population because they're speaking with each other. You know, so so for example, that that the spaceship one, uh, I could debate with colleagues what the best image of that multiple streams is for a long time, and only we would care. You know, so I, I think it's a different discipline when you're trying to show the value of these images to a wider a wider audience. Yeah. So to be honest, for most of my career, you know, it's it's been very difficult to get anyone interested in policy studies stuff at all. You know, and that's fine because that's not really what we're doing. We're just 